Amen. You may be seated. 175. 175.
on, the choir comes down. Let's stand this morning, say hello and shake hands. Well, good morning. We want to welcome you to Tri-State Baptist Temple this morning. We're excited to be here, to be in the Lord's house, and looking forward to hearing uh, the preaching of God's Word today. I hope you've come expecting to hear from the Lord and uh, expecting to hear a message that uh, from God. So we're excited to be here. We do want to make a few announcements and remind you about some of the things that are going on. Uh, in our church this week, uh, we're going to have our next uh, community outreach on Tuesday. We'll go out and uh, knock on doors, uh, uh, follow the pattern of the New Testament. Those uh, apostles and disciples went door to door knocking and uh, just being a, a witness for Jesus Christ. And uh, uh, we're excited about that. And uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to be doing that on Tuesday. So I want to encourage you to come out. We'll meet at 6.30 and, and we uh, Begin working on that. Our next joy uh, trip is August the 18th. We want to remind our uh, members of our joy group or just over youth group to uh, be here for our uh, next joy trip, August the 18th, going to that Magic Mart. I know that's been a, a fun trip in the past to go to that store and uh, see some things. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. So if you're part of the joy trip, uh, group. Make sure you mark that down. Our next Faithful Men's Fellowship is August the 15th. We want all of our men to mark that date down as well. Have our next uh, Men's uh, Fellowship. Have a good breakfast. Spend some time in God's words. We want to encourage all of our men to come and be a part of that as well. We're looking forward to uh, lots of different things that are going on in the life of our church. And uh, we're having, uh, our youth group's having a uh, back-to-school barbecue on Friday, and we're excited about that, uh, kind of kicking off a new uh, season of our youth ministry and uh, looking forward to having that uh, event and uh, inviting some new, uh, new uh, people to come be a part of that, our youth group. Uh, we're doing some different, uh, just structuring things differently, starting uh, with this new school year. So we're excited about it, looking forward to it. They're going to have teams and all kinds of different things to do. So uh, we've been excited and talking about it a lot, and now we're ready to be able to get started this week. And so I hope you'll pray for that as well. But uh, it's been uh, a good day to be in the Lord's house today. We're excited to hear preaching of God's word. But before then, we're going to ask our men to come. We will take up tithes, offering, and our uh, faith promise uh, 
uh, missions offering this morning. Amen. Well, let's pray this morning. Amen. Well, it's a joy to see everyone today. Thank you for coming and being here and being in our services. And uh, we're kind of moving into a new type of our, our season of the year. Schools are getting ready to start back up and uh, different things will be happening as we move into the fall. And it's an exciting time of the year. It's a good time of the year. I enjoy many of the things we have coming up soon. And, and I'm thankful for you all being here in our services today. Uh, Appreciate folks praying for us as we were out of town last week and had a few vacation days and it was good to be with family and uh, mom and dad were down for a few days and Angie's parents Chuck and Linda were there and uh, Evan and Lydia and uh, then uh, Drew and Nikki and their family was there as well and so we enjoyed a good week of vacation and uh, it's good to, to be back. Always, uh, always glad to get back and get ready to get into the, all the things we have coming up here this time of the year. Appreciate folks praying for us. And uh, yesterday we had a quite a day trying to get back. We left early yesterday morning to come back uh, and and uh, get back at a reasonable time of the evening. And uh, I noticed that I was having a water pump problem on my truck. It was leaking. And I was just praying, boy, help us get home here, and, and I'll get that thing fixed as soon as I get home. And I was watching it, but I wasn't real optimistic about it. And uh, so we were uh, just coming out of North Carolina into Virginia on Interstate 77 yesterday, and I was following behind Drew and Nikki, and they have an RV, one of those you drive, you know, uh, and uh, a big black puff come out from behind it, and... All of a sudden, half of Drew's tires laying in the street, and uh, and he blew a tire out on the back end of that RV, and so we all pulled off on the highway, and and uh, boy, I tell you, it was just one of those things where he didn't have a jack to lift his RV or a lug wrench to get the tire off. He had a spare, but couldn't do anything with it. So we had to call. He had to call around and try to get help. On a Saturday, about four o'clock on the highway, uh, get help to change that tire, and uh, boy, it wasn't good. And uh, we tried a lot of things and didn't work. And so uh, we were about nine miles from the nearest exit. And I thought, well, we're not doing the mean good sitting here. Uh, we're going to go up to the next exit, get off, see if we can find some help up there, somebody that has a tire shop or a somewhere where we can try to get him back some help. So we pulled in a gas station and in the back of that thing was one of these 24 hour road service trucks working on a big rig. And so we stopped and talked to that man and he said, sure, you know, just give, you take this number and call it and 
whatever. So anyway, long time later that night, they got their tire fixed. Uh, but they wound up just staying at a nearby campground because they were too tired and exhausted to make that trip home last night. And, and that was the best thing they could have done, just get some rest. But we went ahead then and started north, and Evan and Lydia were in their truck, and we were pulling the truck and camp, had the truck in our camper. And boy, I just was praying. And then what we started making a noise. You know, them screeching noises are never good. And, uh, and so anyway, uh, we were heading home and uh, uh, coming out of uh, North Carolina into Virginia, there's two big tunnels on 77, you know, those big Walker Mountain and then the next one. And we got stopped dead in traffic at, at that tunnel. I mean, just stopped. And that's the worst possible thing can happen, you know. And so anyway, we got inside that tunnel and we noticed there was, uh, we thought steam coming out from under the hood of the truck, but the temperature gauge didn't, didn't act like that was the case. And I, I realized later on that was the belt burning up on the truck. Uh, as that water pump probably would seize and stop, it was just burning that belt. So we got through that tunnel, started down the other way, and about halfway down that mountain, it just broke and came loose. Well, then you have no steering and you have no brakes and you have none of those things, you know. Uh, so thankfully, the Lord, uh, we came right up on an exit at, at, at a little place called Bland. Have you all seen that? Bland, Virginia. And we got, I don't think there's anything else at Bland but the Dollar Tree, Dollar General that we stopped in their parking lot. That was the only thing there. And, uh, but the good thing about that was is we were just not far away from Chilhawi where Chuck and Linda live. And Chuck has a diesel mechanic there in his church, uh, Dan's Diesel Shop. And he brought a rollback out and uh, we just unhooked my truck and they put it on that thing and took it back to Chilhawi. It's down there today and he's gonna fix it for me and let me know and I'll go get it. And, uh, and we hooked our camper up to Evan's truck and we just came on home. <laughs> so there's more way than one to skin a cat in there. So, so anyway, uh, it was an eventful day to say the least. And, uh, but we're back and uh, you know, uh, you don't know, I know we said while we were there, we'd rather been making it home. I, I would have liked to got my truck back here and fixed it myself and saved myself all that money. Uh, but uh, it didn't work out that way. But, you know, we don't know what the Lord kept us from on the highway. And we said that. You don't know what we avoided by being set there, broke down. And so the Lord's always good to us, isn't he? And uh, so we're thankful. But we had a good trip, and uh, it, was, it was good. Uh, Miss Kathy has her sister here who lives in Myrtle Beach, and uh, they're going back down that way tomorrow. So you might find parts of Drew's rubber tire and my belt or somewhere on the interstate. Uh, but uh, just go on, and it's not going to do anybody any good now. But, uh, but uh, we're thankful for a good trip, and we enjoyed it and had a good time with our family. Uh, in thinking about, talking about trips, don't forget our Amish country trip. If you're going with us on the Amish country trip, uh, that $50 room deposit was due today. We tried to have that posted ahead. And so if you can, be sure you reserve your room by making that $50 deposit. And you can make that in the form of a check and just turn it in, write Amish on the bottom for comments or in cash, put it in an envelope, put Amish country. But I have to make those, I have to make that reservation, secure it this week with that, with that deposit money. So $50 per room. And I do have two rooms now that are open. If anyone would still like to go, you can still get in on the trip. Just let me know. Uh, but I need a $50 deposit for everyone uh, that's planning on attending the trip. We need that in today if we can. And uh, that would be a big help for us. But it's a great day. Uh, I know that uh, uh, it's an exciting day. We've got oh, Anna's having a birthday today. Aren't you, Anna? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep, and, uh, and not only do we have a birthday, but we have a new baby here today, and so we're excited about that. Uh, Zach, who is that you have right there with you today? That's Reagan, and uh, we are so excited she's here today, and Mom and Dad are doing a great job, and, 
And uh, you, they don't look like first-time parents, do they? I mean, they're put together. They look like they're rested and <laughs> everything's ready. <laughs> Except Dad's mixing up a bottle back there. And <laughs> you got to multitask, don't you? And, uh, and things can happen at any moment. But we're sure glad they're all here today. And, and it's just a blessing to have them. And we're excited about it. And then don't forget that next Sunday night, we're going to be having a shower for, uh, for uh, Taylor and Hannon and their new baby they're expecting. And that's next Sunday night after the church service. So I, I like it. Y'all just keep these babies coming, all right? Just, and uh, and it's, it's wonderful. And uh, we're thankful. Uh, so don't forget that next Sunday evening after the evening service, it's for the whole church. Everyone's invited. All the men can come and uh, bring a card or bring a gift uh, and bring some food, all right? So the men will have something to do, okay? And uh, it's, we're just want to have some refreshments, just some snacks, some finger foods, things like that. And then we'll have some fellowship after uh, the service next Sunday night and, and just rejoice and be excited with them. And, and uh, so it's, it's good, isn't it? Good around here to see these things happen. And so we're thankful and we're blessed because of that. And uh, we're thankful you're here today as well. God bless you. It's good to, good to see you. We do still have some people out taking last-minute trips and things before school gets started. Uh, so pray for them, and things will settle in here. Uh, we've got some folks who are going to be starting college for the first time this year and uh, all kinds of things going on. People going into youth group here in a few weeks when they promote up into youth group and all kinds of exciting things going on here for our young people. So we're glad you're here as well. But uh, we're thankful for God's goodness to us. Uh, I appreciate the men who, uh, our brother Matheny for preaching last Sunday. I enjoy Keith. He's one of my favorite men. He does such a good job. And uh, he's a, he, he not only is talented with all that illusion stuff, but he's a good preacher. He can just preach, and yes. he does a great job, and I'm thankful for him. And I appreciated Josh stepping in and helping us in so many areas as well. And I'm excited to see him growing and his family in the Lord and uh, just such a good thing. And so we appreciate everybody who helped. Folks covered bus routes and helped out in Sunday school and, and did so many things. And, you know, Evan, Mary, and Lydia really messed things up because now they go with us when we leave and leave on a trip and I can't rely on him because I used to put so much on him and now I'm thankful for me and John stepping up and helping in the patch club and uh, folks so we're thankful for our men and folks who can stand in and help us and that's what it's all about isn't it and I'm, I'm glad and thankful well it's good to see you today uh, we want to preach this morning from 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and I hope you'll find 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And uh, we're going to begin uh, today, and, and we did last uh, Sunday that I was here. Uh, we're going to continue to preach on the thought of growing in Christ's likeness. Uh, I don't know about you. I, I hope that if you know the Lord as your Savior, there's a desire in your heart to become more like Him. I, I know that the, the best thing that anyone can come in contact with in my life is Jesus Christ. It's going to be Him. That's the best thing anyone's going to come in contact with. And if I can allow Him to be lifted up in my life and through my life, then I know that He will impact the lives of others. And I know that as I allow Him to have control of my life, that my life will be more profitable to God, and God can use my life uh, for more fruit and that my life will bring him glory. We ought to want to glorify God. He deserves it. He's worthy of glory because of who and what he's done. And so today, I want you to think about growing in Christ's likeness. And I'm going to preach on this subject, changed by his glory. Changed by his glory. And we're going to find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So you follow with me. We're going to begin in verse 17, and I'm going to read down through chapter 4 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and uh, let's start. You follow along. I'll read in verse 17. Now, the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, 
even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And we'll stop right there, but you'll notice in verse number 18 that phrase, changed, changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And by the grace of God today, <clears throat> we ought to desire <clears throat> to be changed by the glory of God into the image of His Son, to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to look at today. Heavenly Father, thank you for a good day and for this weekend and for the Lord's Day and for all the good things, God, that you've done for us. We thank you for uh, new babies in church and new moms and dads and those, Lord, that will be welcoming, Father, the birth of another child into their lives and for all these young lives and teenagers and young adults and, Lord, for men and women who are serving you and living for you in our church and, Lord, for those who are here today ready to hear from your word and, God, we pray you'd put within our all of our hearts a desire to grow, to become more like Jesus Christ, less and less of the person we know we really are, uh, Lord, without you. And Lord, we want to become more like you so that you can be glorified through our life. And Lord, others will be reached with the gospel. And Lord, your work, Lord, will go forward. And uh, Father, we just ask God your blessings now. Uh, we have no dependence or confidence in our flesh, but God only in the Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we're praying today the power of God's Word and the Spirit of God would do their work. Meet each of us here today at the place that we need to be met. Lord, if there's someone who's come to church today but has never come to Jesus Christ, we pray today they'll be saved. They'll, they'll deal, Lord, with the greatest issue of life, and that is salvation for their soul. And so, Lord, we just pray you'll teach us and we'll grow. Uh, God, we uh, deserve to respond. That Your Word deserves our response. And, Lord... We want to be obedient people, so uh, just do what only you can do, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, when Lydia was young, when she was just a little girl, five, six, seven years old, we were butterfly and moth hunters, and we had a nice property, piece of property, an acre yard and a big backyard, and and I don't know, our neighbors probably wonder what's that grown man doing running through the backyard with a butterfly net, but... Uh, but she and I would do that. We would get out there and run around and catch butterflies and moths and different things. And, and one of the things we liked to do was we would find a caterpillar, and we would take that caterpillar, and Lydia had a little black bug box, a little clear box with a black lid, and uh, we would build a little habitat for that. We'd put some fresh leaves in there, and, and we would take a, a leaf and drip a few drops of water on it for some water and put that little caterpillar in there, and then we'd get us a little stick or a twig and we would break it and lean it up so that it was leaning in there and put the lid on it and then we would just watch that caterpillar and before long it would begin to spin a cocoon and before long it would just be hanging off of that twig in that little package and we would get excited about what was going to come out of there. Would it be a butterfly? Would it be a moth? You know, and what would it look like? And so we watched many different metamorphoses. We understand now is what that was. Uh, but we watched that a lot, and it was exciting. Then to take that thing loose and take it outside and take that lid off and see that, the, that ugly old caterpillar now, what it had become and what it had been changed into. And, you know, when we get saved by the grace of God, it is God's plan for every child of God to undergo a metamorphosis. He wants us to change from what we used to be without Jesus Christ to what we can be in Jesus Christ as we allow him to go to work in our life. And, uh, you know, we are all different. We have different pasts, but every child of God has one predetermined future, and that is that we become like Jesus Christ. We let him live through our life so others can see him, and we reflect him and bring him glory. That's his will for every born-again believer. I recently read of a man who had a similar experience like Lydia and I. He had a caterpillar, 
and he put that thing in a cage or a tank and he watched it go through that change. But as it began to emerge from that chrysalis or that cocoon, he, he noticed how much it was struggling to get out and he felt sorry for it. So he took a pair of scissors and he just cut that cocoon just enough so that that little caterpillar that had changed now into a butterfly could get out very easily. But what the fellow didn't realize was is, is that when he did that, uh, he, he, he realized it never ever flew. It never stretched its wings all the way out. It seemed like it never fully developed into what he thought that it was going to be. And he learned that the reason was is that the struggle that that little insect had to emerge from that cocoon, that process of the struggle of that change, that's what invigorated that butterfly. It made the blood flow into its wings as it had to struggle to get out. And when it finally would burst forth then, uh, the blood would have expanded its wings and given it the strength that it needed to get out and fly. In other words, without that process, and without the struggle and the challenges of that change, then it never became all that it was intended to be. And you know, sad part of the, of the, of the reality of the matter is, is that God has a plan for our transformations, uh, but, uh, but sometimes we never uh, become all that God would plan for us to be. And, you know, God has a plan for you, and it's not going to be through your strength that you uh, go through that transformation. It won't be by your own wisdom, but it will be by the work of God. It will be by the wisdom and grace of God of taking you through that process of, of transformation. In our text today here, Paul was writing to the believers at the church in Corinth, and he was looking into the Word of God. And when Paul looked into the Word of God, and as we see it here, uh, we see Jesus Christ in the Word of God. We see Him in the Scriptures. And, and as Paul saw Him, he began to know and understand that Jesus Christ lived in him. Paul understood. He, he talks about it here in verse 17. He said, now the Lord is that Spirit, with a capital S. In other words, Jesus Christ, the, the Holy Spirit, are one and the same, and Paul knew they lived in Him. They had come to live in Him. And now Paul began to understand and know that, uh, that as Christ lived in Him, the Holy Spirit lived in Him, Paul's life went through a dramatic transformation, a dramatic metamorphosis from what he used to be uh, to what he was after he was saved. And, you know, you think back and you know a little bit about Paul. Paul was Saul. Paul, uh, Saul was a persecutor of the church. He put to death people who believed and professed faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was a wicked man, a difficult, a, a, a hard man. But after his say, he was saved, and after he went through that transformation, how his life changed. And you know, uh, God wants the change in your life to continue. And He wants uh, your life to change as well. Just think back to when you were saved. Think back to when you were saved. And by the way, uh, everybody here today, there ought to be a time and a place in your life when you know and you realize that you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. There's a time and a place when you realized you were lost, you were a sinner, and you knew that you were on your way to hell. And you ask God to forgive you of your sin that sent His Son to suffer on the cross. And by faith you rested your soul in Jesus Christ as, as your, uh, as your uh, salvation. And if there's not a time and a place you can look to in your life today where you know you were born again, when you know you were saved, that's the greatest need in your life. And you can settle that. The Bible said today is the day of salvation. You can make that sure today. Uh, John, uh, the little book of John, the Bible said you can know that you have eternal life. And so that's the most important thing in your life. But think back to when you were saved. Remember your life before you were saved. And I know that if you're saved today by the grace of God, you'll agree with me that there was a change that took place when you got saved. Now, for one thing, it was an eternal change. Because you who were lost and on your way to hell then became a child of God and you had a home in heaven now reserved for you. 
There was an eternal change that took place in your life when you were saved. But God wants the change in your life to continue and increase as you live through your life in this world. He wants you to grow and become more and more like Jesus Christ. Now, sad, uh, sadly, some of us have stopped growing like we should. We're not growing and changing anymore like we ought to be. Uh, we've not allowed God to grow us and continue His transforming work in our lives. Uh, salvation is a spiritual work of God. Only God can save. Only God can save. And the transformation and change that God desires for our lives, it's a spiritual work. We can't do it, but God can and God will. But we have to allow Him to do His work in our life. That we have to allow the work of the Spirit of God to continue in our life. In verse 17 there, Paul went on to say, And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. He's talking about the Spirit of God in his life. In verse number 18, he says, But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, spiritual growth and the transformation that God wants in our lives to become more and more like Jesus Christ, more pleasing to God, more useful to God, uh, more blessed in our own life, more fulfilled in our own hearts and lives. That happens as we look into the Word of God and see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. To see and know what it is that they've done for us and that they live in us. This is a source of the power of the change and transformation for our lives. And may the Lord help us to grow again. May He help us to keep growing, to allow God to continue His work in us for the glory of God, by the glory and power of God, for the souls that Jesus Christ died for, and for our own lost loved ones and families. May we continue to grow. Now let me give you three things quickly here about growing by grace, by growing by the glory of God. Number one, one of the ways that we will grow by looking into God's Word and seeing the glory in God is we're going to be humbled by His glory. You know, some of the things that grow us the most in life are when we get humbled real good, isn't it? That's a real growing factor. And, and it's the same as we look into the Word of God. You know, it's humbling uh, to truly see and begin to understand who God is. See, we live in a world today that uses the name God or they speak about God but, but the sad thing is that they really don't know the true God of the Bible. And when we begin to really see Him and we see His glory and we begin to really see and understand the power of God, it will humble us. It will humble us to see the grace and glory of Jesus Christ, to see His sinlessness. How perfect that He was. How perfectly obedient He was. How His life pleased God. How He was used of God to see that. And then to look honestly at ourself. And realize at who and what we are without Him. To see and know what we have and can or have not and cannot accomplish without Him. To really see that. And that, and that this God... This perfect Savior, He loves us, that He was willing to save us. If we know who and what we really are, it's a humbling thing, isn't it? Humbling thing. Back in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, this happened in the life of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah, trying to serve God and trying to fulfill God's plan and goal for his life, he never really accomplished and succeeded until he really saw who God was. And when he saw who God was, he saw who he was. And it humbled him. And he began to grow then and glorify God and serve God and live for God. In Isaiah 6 verse 1, the Bible said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. 
Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When we truly get a vision of who God really is, when we really understand that, listen, all of creation revolves around Jesus Christ. It always has and it always will. And whether we see it or not, this world is filled with the glory of Jesus Christ as the Creator God. And it's filled with His love and grace. And, you know, you go away somewhere uh, at the ocean or on the coast in the beach, and you just look around at creation, and the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament uh, declareth His handiwork. And you drive back through the mountains, and, and I tell you, we were coming up before all the uh, mayhem started to happen yesterday, and we look over, and, and there's two little black bears right on the side of 77 in the mountains down there, just gray, just digging around on the, on the side of the mountain there and uh, deer all over the place, and all the different types of birds that you see at the ocean. Man, just incredible. And they are just created perfectly, and, and God just made them each one different to do their own thing. And, and uh, this world's filled with the glory of God. We are nothing in, uh, in comparison to God. He is everything, and He has all power. And may the Lord help us not to fill our eyes with ourselves or with men or with other people or their accomplishments, but may our heart and life be filled with the glory and power of God. And when we see God, then we, we see the glory of God, then we will be humbled by that. And I tell you, when we get humbled, we'll see our own sinfulness. When we see who God really is in Jesus Christ, we see our own sinfulness. You know, I was saved by the grace of God through faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing else could save me and nothing else can save you. Right. Only that God loved us in Christ, the perfect son died to pay our sin debt. God accepted that sacrifice. It's the only one that would pay that sin debt. And I came uh, to Christ as God led me to him for salvation because I realized I was a sinner. I was a sinner. I was condemned to hell because of my sin. Romans chapter 3 says the, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. And, you know, I'm still in this flesh, in this life, I'm still a sinner today. And, and I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm going to live in heaven someday because of Jesus Christ and because of His righteousness, but not mine. Here I'm still a sinner. And I still have that same old sin nature I had before I got saved. And I realize today if I don't grow, if I don't keep yielding my life to the Spirit of Christ in me uh, and allowing God to change me, I'm never going to be anything, any good for God in this world. I'm not going to be used of Him. I'm not going to bring Him glory. I'm not going to further His work in the world. Uh, that old man that I was can't do any of that. And the only hope I have is Christ living in me who can change me, uh, who can make me usable and help me to bring glory to God. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul writing to the Galatian church said, this, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. I cannot do what I want to do. Even though when I got saved, God put a new wanter in me. I got a new piece of equipment. I got a new wanter. And where I used to never want to read the Bible or pray or serve God or go to church or, or see God's kingdom go further and see people get saved, I used to never want that. But now I want that because he put a new wanter in me. Even though I know and want those things, I could never do them in the power of my flesh. I need to be changed and transformed. I, I need to become made. I'm, I need to be new here. Uh, and, and this is what happens when we yield our life to, to God. Let Him grow us to make us more like Christ. Our flesh is always in opposition to the Spirit of God within us and His will for our life. Our flesh is always in opposition. And it's not always manifested by outward sin. I want you to think about this. I want you to think about growing. And if you're not growing, Pastor, why am I not growing? I don't outwardly, I'm not outwardly involved in some big sin. And that may be true. It's probably true, hopefully, of most of us. 
We're not involved in some outward, uh, you know, gross act of sin. But I tell you what equally stops our growth, it's our inward attitudes right. of the flesh. Yeah. Our flesh being in control. And that stops our growth in Christ-likeness. Uh, not realizing how much we need to draw near to the Lord. Not realizing how much we need to spend time in the Word of God and, and prayer and, and being faithful to God and giving to the work of the Lord and witnessing, not realizing in our heart how much we need that. But that's our purpose, living like we don't need it or living like it's for someone else. Uh, these things stop us from growing. They hinder our growth and becoming more like Christ. Uh, sometimes it's in how we treat others. Our attitudes toward them, the way we treat them, that, that's an evidence that we're not growing. Uh, maybe it's a husband and their wife, or a wife and their husband, or parents with their children, or parents with their parents. Or sometimes maybe it's just how we as God's people, supposedly God's people, treat the lost. You know, we, uh, we may not know an individual, uh, and we maybe treat them in a way that's disrespectful, or is unkind, or uncruel, it's cruel. Uh, you know... Uh, how are we going to glorify God in that or draw them and win them to Christ if we're not growing in Christ's likeness? And it's so important. It's so important. Uh, you know, uh, our flesh is wicked. We have a nature that's sinful. We need to be changed. When we truly see the glory of God in Jesus Christ, we'll see how sinful we are, how much change really needs to take place. And then also you'll see the truth of the Scripture. When we get humbled by seeing the Lord, we're going to see the truth of God's word as it applies to him, but also how it applies to us. In Romans, 5, uh, Romans 6, verse 6, Paul wrote, writes and says, Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, with Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we uh, be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. You know, there are some truths in the Scripture that we need to recognize and live in each day uh, that we might grow and continue to be changed to be more like Christ. On the cross, Jesus Christ defeated our enemies, all that would hinder us, all that should defeat us and stop us from growing and becoming glorifying to God and being usable to Him. He defeated all of them. He defeated all of them. He defeated Satan forever on the cross. He overcame the influence of the world. He overcame the passions of the flesh. He put all of those things to death. He defeated them so we can defeat them too. So that we can grow. So that we can be changed. In 1 John chapter 5, the Bible says there beginning in verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And that is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth Jesus is the Son of God. Listen, if we have faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ, we can have victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. We can grow. We can put uh, to death that old flesh. Uh, we can live in the newness of life. We can see our life changed. We can uh, we can live uh, by faith in the Word of God and choose to live in obedience to His Word by faith and our lives can be changed. And that begins by seeing the glory of God because it will humble us. It will help us to see how sinful that we are and we'll be, we'll be changed and helped as we see His glory. Uh, let's look at a second thing. Not only are we humbled by His glory, but we'll, we'll be helped by His glory. See, we can't live the Christian life in the power of our own flesh and strength. We can't do that. It's not possible. Not even by our greatest determination can we live a Christian life. Living a true Christian life and, and being set apart in this world uh, for Christ uh, is going to be challenging. And it's often going to be discouraging. And we need the help of God. We need His Spirit. We need the Word of God. If we're not growing in our Christ likeness, then we are being defeated by our enemies. Because there is victory in Christ. And there's growth and change in the victory we have in Him. So if we're not growing in Christ's likeness, we're being defeated by our enemies. By the world, the flesh, the devil, by one, more, or all of them. 
They're overcoming us. They're defeating us. And we'll not be steadfast and faithful when we are being defeated by our enemies. Uh, we'll become stagnant. We'll become defeated people, even though we're saved people. And when we do grow, and as we allow God to change and transform our lives, we'll find the help that we need there to run our race, to, to run the race with patience, to finish as Paul finished, to, uh, to fight the good fight of faith. Uh, when, we, uh, when we look to Christ and when we are growing and humbled and realize our sinfulness and how much we need to change uh, in our life, uh, then we'll find the help we need to fight the good fight and finish the course. Pastor, how can we be helped by the glory of God? Well, we're helped because of the help of the joy of our salvation. The joy of salvation helps us. Think about what 1 Peter chapter 1 says, Whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. When a child of God sees God and Jesus Christ in the glory and power and love for them and the mercy of God, when we begin to study them and see them in the word of God, when they... Uh, when, when, the, when we see uh, and realize our own sinfulness and weakness, then we're going to have a joy in the Lord that the world cannot take away. We know who we are. And if we're honest, we're all low down, no good dogs. I mean, any good thing about any of us. But God, in all of His glory, who loved us, gave Jesus Christ for us, His perfect Son. And His Son came and was willing to suffer, to be made sin, to be forsaken by the Father, to drink the cup of the wrath of God for the sin debt of all humanity, to give up His life, and then to, to die for us, to be buried, uh, ri rising again with eternal life. When we understand all that God is and has done for us, then there's going to be a joy there in knowing Him as our Savior that the world cannot separate us from. It cannot overcome that. It cannot defeat that. It'll strengthen us. It'll help us as we grow and become more and more like Him. We'll have a joy of the Lord in knowing Him and being in Him. And there'll be a joy in serving Him and living for Him that the world cannot give us simply because we know the glory of our God and Savior and that He loved us and gave Himself for us. They'll be the help of the joy of the Lord. They'll be the help of the peace of God. In Philippians 4, verse 7, the Bible said, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When a child of God knows the love and mercy and the power of God, and when they see the glory of God, There'll be a peace that nothing in the world of the world can take away. Romans 8 verse 31 says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And we have nothing to fear when we know the love and mercy of God and we have the joy of being saved and the peace of God that there is nothing in this world that we should fear. I think if there's anything lost people fear, it's they fear death. They fear dying. And, uh, you know, for a child of God, a believer, we, we need not ever fear anything ever again. Our greatest fear ought to be in that we fear our God. Not living for Him, not serving Him, not, not allowing Him to have control of our life, not making a difference in the world, not glorifying Him. That's the thing we ought to fear the most of standing before Him someday with a missed opportunity of life. We don't need to fear him. I love to tell the story, and I've told it a hundred times. John R. Rice, one of the great fundamental independent Bible preachers in America, he preached camp meetings all across the country under big tents with thousands of people saved under those meetings. He was the founder and editor of the Sword of the Lord magazine and newspaper for a long time. 
John R. Rice, and he was preaching in a meeting about, he was preaching about drinking and liquor and how it's sin for alcohol to uh, be in a, you know, a believer's life and preaching about adultery and fornication and just preaching about sin. And one night after a service, a drunken, uh, lost man came up to him and met him right in the middle of the sawdust aisle of that old tent and pulled a pistol out and stuck it right in his stomach. And he said, I'm going to kill you. He was drunken and filled full of the influence of the devil. And John R. Smith said, you can't threaten me with heaven. You can't threaten me with heaven. He wasn't afraid of that. He wasn't afraid of dying. And when you take away the fear of death, there is nothing that a believer should fear. I'm never going to die. I'm not going to die. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. There's never going to be a moment. Death is separation. Death means to be separated. I'm never going to die that second death. I'm never going to be separated from God. And, and we have nothing to fear. And, and when we have that peace of God and we have the joy of God in our life, when we face whatever it is the world and the devil and our own flesh bring at us, uh, we can grow through that. It can help us. And we'll grow through those times in life so that we can become more and more like Jesus Christ. You know, it's easy. It's inevitable to get dissatisfied, to get discouraged, to get disillusioned, even to become defeated when we try to live the Christian life in our own power or when we stop growing we get in those situations in life when we've not allowed the transforming work of God to continue in our life but when we see the glory of God and when we know the joy of his salvation and when we let the peace of God fill our heart and life then we have the help we need to live faithfully for him to live fruitfully for Him. It will change your life. As we look into the Word of God and see the glory of God, it humbles us. It shows us our sin, but it helps us because we realize it is that great God that loves us and that He lives within us and that His love is never-ending and that uh, His grace is always sufficient. And there's a joy there that will, that will help us to, uh, to have rest and a peace that we need not fear. The glory of God. Let me give you one last thought. The Holy Spirit motivates us for the glory of God. The Spirit of God. Paul's writing about the Spirit of God here living in his life and how the Spirit of God and the Word of God brought about such a transformation in his life. The only way a child of God can consistently live a true Christian life, the only way we can serve the Lord faithfully and glorify God faithfully is when we surrender our life to God's purpose for it. God saved it. God has a purpose for it. Just like every creature on the, on the beach and in the ocean has a purpose and has a reason, well, you have a purpose you have a reason. God saved you for it. And it's, it is similar in the fact that we're all believers. Ultimately, we're to glorify Him and point souls to Christ. But how we accomplish that will all be a little bit different in our own lives, in our own ways. And we all have some differences, but the same as believers. And just as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived to please the Father, to serve God the Father, and surrender His will to God the Father, so the Holy Spirit of God will lead you as a believer to do the same thing, to live for Him, to surrender your life to Him, to bring glory to Him, to fulfill the work God uh, has for your life. Uh, this, this is how the Holy Spirit will help you to grow. This is how He will lead you. In John chapter 16, the Bible says in the 13th verse, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit of God will motivate you for the glory of God. He'll do it because he'll motivate you to serve Jesus Christ. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8, when Isaiah saw God, he said, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then said, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And God said, go and tell this people. Go and tell them. 
Why are so many of God's people not growing and not serving and not living and not reaching the world and not praying for the lost and laborers and being faithful to church and giving to further work of God? Because we really don't know who it is that we have to do with. We really don't know who this God is that we say we love and that we profess has saved us. Because if we really got a glimpse of Him and who He really is, it'd humble us to the point where there wouldn't be anything in life we'd want to do but try to serve Him in some way. Lord, here am I. What can I do because of all You've done for me? But the sad thing is, some people have never seen Him. They've never seen Him like that. But when we do, when we do, the Holy Spirit will motivate us to serve Him. And if you're trying to live the Christian life or to serve God for any other reason than for the glory and mercy of God, you won't keep it up very long. If there's any other reason why you're doing it, eventually that, that, that'll be a disillusioning thing. You'll get discouraged. You'll quit. But if you're doing it for the glory of God... Because someday you want to be able to stand before him and say, Lord, by the grace of God, somehow, some way, I hope you've been able to use my life for your glory. Then that's what will motivate you. That will keep you faithfully serving the Lord. But when you meet God through his word and see him in his glory and are humbled by his love and mercy and what Jesus Christ has done for you, then you'll follow the Holy Spirit as he leads you to serve him. He'll lead you to serve him. Paul said it's a reasonable service. Remember in Romans 12, verses 1 and 2? He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What else could we, uh, could we desire to do when we know what it is that he has done for us? What else could there be that we should want to do but to serve him, to see his work go forward, to glorify him? He'll help us and he'll strengthen us for the work of God and for His glory. You know, the Holy Spirit motivates us not only to serve Him, but to draw near and obey Jesus Christ. John 6, the Lord was speaking to His disciples, beginning in verse 66. He said, From that time many of His disciples went back and walked no more with Him, and then said, Jesus, son of the twelve, will you also go away? And then Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you sure about that today? Has it affected, does it grip your very soul? Do you know who it is that has saved you? Do you know why you're not going to be in hell today, ever? And has it ever occurred to you that it's reasonable for you to surrender your life to him? To give everything about your life, live, move, and have your being in Him so that He can be glorified and so that the work of God can move forward. Because when we really see the Lord and we're humbled and we realize what joy there is in serving Him and the peace He brings into our heart and life, the Holy Spirit's right there. Paul said, that same Spirit is the Lord and He is in you and He'll take the truth of the truth you see about God in the Word and He'll help you to see your life transformed he'll help you to serve the lord and live for him you know there's nothing we could attain in this world than to allow god by his grace to make us more and more like jesus christ there should there can be anything we could attain that's any greater than that and the holy spirit will motivate us to glorify god matthew 5 verse 16 let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. John 12, 32, And I, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. When you're growing in Christ's likeness and God is transforming your life, the desire of your heart is that others will see Jesus Christ and that they will respond to Him. But they will be saved. The greatest glory that God and Jesus Christ can receive is the salvation of a soul because it's, it's, it's testifying that there is no God but God, no Savior but Jesus Christ, none other anywhere in the world and it brings glory to them, it glorifies them and when we can be used of God to lead or point some soul to Jesus Christ our lives can't bring him any more glory any other way 
They can't glorify him any greater than that way. And it's not going to matter what we do in service for him or who knows or doesn't know what we do. When we really want to serve him and live for his glory, what will matter most in life is the glory of God. That he gets the glory. That he gets the honor <clears throat> for, for what has been accomplished. And God is glorified by how much you allow him to work in you. How much you allow him to change you from who you are and who you were to who you can be and who he is in your own heart and in your own life. That's how we, that's how we measure how much we're glorifying him. If I'm still that same old person living that same old fleshly carnal life, I'm not bringing him any glory. But if I'm letting him change me, if I'm growing to become more and more like him, then I know that, that there's something there that he can use for his honor and glory. I want, I, want him to be, I want him to be glorified in my life, don't you? I want to grow and be changed so that, so that he can have something to use to, to point souls to himself. Well, let's pray together. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. There could be someone here today in this service right now who say, Pastor, if I die today, I do not have peace or assurance that I would go to heaven. I can't tell you a time or a place in my life when I repented of my sin and I asked Jesus Christ to forgive me and to save me. As far as I know today, I am lost. I need Jesus Christ. I'm not saved. I wonder if there's someone in this building from the front to the back, you'd be honest enough just to say, Pastor, that's who I am. Uh, please pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up and let me just see it? I don't have assurance. I don't know that I'm saved today. Uh, I've never asked God to forgive me or Christ to save me, anyone in the building, anywhere at all. If you're here today and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, it is God's plan for you to change. God wants to transform your life. He wants your life to reflect Jesus Christ, His love, His grace, His mercy, His uh, long-suffering patience, and His meekness and His gentleness. These are the ways that He wants you to interact with the lost and others in this world for the glory of God. He wants our lives to be changed from what they were to what they can be and can and should be in Christ who lives in you. Are you growing today? I'm not asking you if you know you're saved. I'm asking you, are you growing? Are you more like Jesus Christ? Are you allowing uh, the, the glory of God to humble your life? Are you allowing it to help you? The glory of God, the joy of salvation, the peace of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Are you allowing the Holy Spirit who lives in you to help change your life by the Word of God? I want to encourage you today. If you're here today and you're not growing, it's been a long time since, since you know that you've had a real hunger for the Word of God, for serving the Lord, for reaching the lost, for seeing souls saved, maybe even in your own family. I want to encourage you today. Why don't you slip out of your seat and come today and say, Lord, by the grace of God, I want to begin to grow in my life. I want to begin to become more and more like Jesus Christ. I want to become more and more. I want my life to reflect Him. I want others to be able to see Him in me so that when I'm speaking to someone, whether it's at Walmart or where I work or wherever it is, that the Holy Spirit of God is changing my life so that in that conversation, they can see Jesus in me. They can see Him in me. That, that they'll be led by Him to come to know Him more. And maybe it'll be an invitation that you give where someone will come to church or a family member who can come and hear the gospel and be saved. Lord, let, let my life be transformed. And you know what? Sometimes it's because we've gotten angry at how hard it is. But don't forget the butterfly and the moth. It's not easy. But God allows those things in our life to strengthen us. And to help us to grow and become everything that we can be. And uh, so today, maybe it's that. Maybe you need to come today and say, Lord, I know I've not responded to those times in my life. Trials, difficulties, uh, the tests. I know I walked away from those things instead of letting you help me with them. And so, Lord, help me today. Whatever the need is in your life, we invite you and we encourage you to come today. And, Lord, may you... May you, in our hearts, give us a sincere desire to grow, to become like Christ. Lord, may we truly see you in the scriptures. 
May we truly see who you are and what you did for us out of love and mercy. We, God, who are vile, wicked sinners, and let you, God, you gave us the very best. You gave us your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, <clears throat> why would we not serve you and live for you and make souls the greatest priority of our life? And help us, God, help us to see you so that our lives will be changed. We ask it all today in Jesus' name. Amen. Some have come. You may need to come. Why don't we stand together? We're going to turn to him. 282 in our hymn book and as we sing that first stanza uh, why don't you just respond to the Lord I hope there's a desire in your heart to be changed by the glory of God and let's sing together that very first stanza hymn 282 just as Sing the second verse, verse two. Sing the last verse, verse number five. This is the last verse. It's been good to be in the Lord's house this morning to be able to hear uh, a message that's preached from God's Word, and we appreciate the message, and uh, we want to glorify the Lord with our lives, and so uh, we pray He'd continue to help us with that and continue to grow in our faith uh, in this area, but we're thankful you are here this morning, and uh, hope uh, you have a good afternoon. Hope everybody will be back tonight, 6 o'clock, and uh, be back here uh, fellowship some more with uh, believers, and then be able to hear another uh, just uh, good uh, Bible message. I hope you'll be back tonight, but uh, thank you for being here today. We'll just have a word of prayer and uh, finish with our services this morning. Look forward to being back tonight. Brother Josh, will you pray for us, please? Amen. Amen.
Five game. Oh, oh. Is that on? NBC. You're right. Eight, eight o'clock. Minnesota Vikings. Good last year in scrimmage too, but yeah. Well, hopefully he'll get his head on the screen. No, Drew. No. 